What's going on everybody? My name is John Hammond and in this video I want to showcase one of the challenges from Parson CTF or their capture the flag a few months ago uh, that was just classic RSA like the simple crypto system except for one small technique and trick at the very very end. So uh, I know I've done this video at least RSA many times before but I do want to highlight and showcase really the trick at the very end because it's easy to forget. Uh, we're going to be just doing simple decryption with RSA and we're given the factors of n and the modulus which are built like to create the actual public key. So those prime numbers P and Q are actually given to us, and that is what you would normally use for N in the modulus. So uh, uh, I've covered this again in other videos. If I do a failure of, a, of some justice to actually present it to you in this video, um, there are plenty others, but I want to showcase really just the trick at the very, very end. So let's go ahead and look through it. I have my terminal open here, and I'll showcase the prompt. It says, Little Dirty Johnny has a filthy mouth. He never watches his P's and Q's. In fact, when he encrypted a flag for us, he left them lying around. Can you clean up his P's and Q's and figure out the flag? So again, as I said, we have these factors here. And we can go ahead and calculate N. And since we really have P and Q, we know the factors, we can determine D, which is that decryption private key here. So I'll scroll down again and actually showcase some of that. Let's fire up a script, and I actually have the flag encrypted here, and that's just a encrypted one, so we'll have to read that in, but let's go ahead and create a script to do all this with it. Let's say just get flag.py, and I will have the Wikipedia page visible down there. Let's go ahead and have a shebang line to work with us here. Let's open up that flag.enc, because that's going to be our ciphertext, so I'm just going to call handle, and I'll use a context manager, because... People yell at me, handle c equals handle dot read, and then let's actually verify that we have the c that we want. Um, okay, cool. So that looks like nonsense. I want to go ahead and actually convert that into a number. So I'm going to use bin ASCII because I think that's pretty well in line with the Python 3 rendition of doing these things. I will go ahead and hexlify this, and then I'll consider that to be an integer. So we can go ahead and convert that as an int base 16. If someone can tell me a better way to do that, but that will go ahead and get a decimal or an integer value for me for Python to work with. So let's just say C equals all of that. Great. Now let's go ahead and actually grab those P and Q values from the original prompt. We can just kind of copy and paste those in here. Okay. So now we can determine N just by simply multiplying P and Q and that will be handy for the rest of the evaluation, but we need to really determine phi, or phi, or the totient. Um, that is what's noted here in the Wikipedia article as kind of the least common multiple, but with prime numbers, it's actually just simple p minus 1 and q minus 1. So that's simple phi, I, or however you want to say that, p minus 1 times the quantity of q minus 1. Now, now that we know phi, and we can assume, let's just use classic standard RSA numbers here, E will go ahead and be that 65537, or in hex 0x0001. I like to remember that one a little bit easier. It's, it, I think it's simpler to remember than the 65535, but whatever. So now we have those values, and we can go ahead and determine D. D is the modular inverse, because of the way that the RSA cryptography works. We're putting together some modulus and arithmetic. If we actually want to determine the private key, um, it is secure because of its modular components here. We can go ahead and determine that. Um, Python offers a nice built-in way to actually calculate that with its Pi cryptography module. If you don't have that, I think it's sudo pip install Pi crypto. Um, I might be wrong in that. And uh, people have told me before, don't use sudo uh, when you're trying to go ahead and pip install stuff. You either use pip install tac tac user or just work in a virtual environment. So, all right, let's go ahead and actually use that module though. It's import crypto capital C dot util capital U capital U <laughs> number import inverse. So, sorry, from that package import this. So now we can go ahead and calculate D. So D will equal the inverse of E. And then phi, I remember that because uh, because of E becomes before P in the alphabet. That's how I just remember those arguments. So now we should be able to determine D is the value we want it to be. It's a number. Cool. I'll trust it. Let's go ahead and calculate now. M equals the power of C raised to D all mod N. 
Great, because that's how you go ahead and do decryption. If I scroll down here, D C raised to the D all mod N is equal to M. So if I go ahead and run this, I didn't print anything out, so we're not going to see anything. If we were to print something out, you can see we have M here, and I'm going to go ahead and convert this into a hexadecimal, hexadecimal value. So let's do hex of that, and let's go ahead and try and convert that to ASCII. So what I'm going to do is going to first cut off that 0x so it's at the front and go all the way to the end here. That L at the end I don't care about, so I'm going to go negative 1, and I have the full hexadecimal value now. So let's go ahead and decode that with bin ASCII, bin ASCII dot unhexlify. Then we'll pass that in. And the error that we get here is we have an odd length string. This is a stumbling block that I think a lot of people kind of didn't get when they went through this challenge. And I actually stumbled with it for way too long. Too long than I, more longer than I should have. More longer. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm bad with words today. So uh, what you can do here is keep in mind that if you have an odd length string that's hex, um, you can work with it in a similar way as you would to begin with, with, with hex already, right? So if I had 0xA, that's the numeric value 10, right? And that string of hex characters minus the 0x is just A, right? But that's an odd length string. There's only one character here. That one is not an even number. That's an odd number. If I wanted to have an even number, it would need to be a multiple of two, right? So uh, why not? Like, what's to stop us from using 0x0a? And hexadecimal is still the exact same value. It's still 10. But that string now, if I were to consider it 0a, that's an even length string. There are two values there. So... If, if you ever see that error, uh, odd length string, when you're trying to decode hex, that's totally fine. Just go ahead and tack on a zero, either at the front, or sometimes you might need it at the end. Maybe some, some CTF challenges will mess with you like that. I, I had some extra parentheses in there. Weird. Okay, Actually, let's, let's try and print this out now, um, and I will use that technique. Uh, I do need to add the zero in here, and remember... That whole thing is what's being passed to uh, hexadecimal, or unhexlify. So if I print that out now, you have a lot of nonsense at the very, very top and beginning, but the flag is there, NCX dirty jokes. So it's hidden, and we would be able to carve it out. Um, if you, for some reason, you do other processing, I tend to wrap string around that, but you shouldn't really need to all that often, because hex is going to be what has a 0x, and you need a slice to begin with. But... Uh, that works. I think I'm, I'm thinking of it the wrong way because I like to use uh, that string and then like a dot decode or something when I was using Python 2. But Python 3 is what I would advocate for now, and that means using bin ASCII dot on hexify. So you don't need that string uh, wrapper. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's that, right? And if you were to if you were to actually add the zero x on at the end, though or sorry, add the new zero character on at the very, very end, that's when you would certainly need to use str to create a string and slice from that. Uh, but you would probably want to do that after you've removed the L, if the L is there. So sometimes you don't really have to trust, or you wouldn't want to trust, that the negative one will cut an L if it's not a long value. Uh, in that case, I just use two sliced, and then I just replace the L with nothing. It's a string, so you can do that, right? Okay, that was a lot of talk, but really the technique and the trick that I wanted to show you is do not forget to do that if you ever see odd length string. Python will, will tell you that, and it might be red and angry, but it's not the end of the world. So uh, be sure to zero, just tack that on, and totally fail when I forget to remove the L. Okay, uh, I want to showcase this with Katana, just to kind of, I don't know, prove that it's doing cool and good things and it's slowly coming together. Um, I know uh, I get anxiety. <laughs> a lot of people get angry when I try and showcase Katana, but I think it's neat. So I have these two files included in the um, test directory that Katana is using. So let me get actually get into that directory and I will go ahead and enter my virtual environment because I have been developing and I want to be in a virtual environment when I'm developing, not just doing simple CTS script code. So uh, I'll showcase the code for this unit. It's in Katana units and it's crypto RSA. 
Uh, I have some baseline things for Wiener's little D attack that I don't need to show you. I'm using something called find variables now, a function that I put together to kind of track down uh, and scan a given file uh, for kind of the variables that would be needed in an RSA challenge. So if they ever tell you n equals this, p equals that, uh, q equals that, d, blah, 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 it uses some regular expressions, pulls that out, and then returns them and is able to determine them. Uh, I track down some extra cases in case it spells out the word modulus and uh, phi or phi because it starts with a p or an m and I don't want to be, to be confused between the words message or the factor p, right? So... Uh, those are, are those extra odd cases. I also have a little bit of notion to go ahead and crack and, and uh, determine the N and E values from a given public key file, like an open SSL certificate or that PEM key sort of thing. So that's handy, and I'll showcase that in another video, but that's the neat little code to do that. Um, and parse int is what we'll go ahead and first try and determine if this is already a number, the value that we find following the string, and then if it's hex, try and unhexify it or whatever, uh, or determine it, blah, blah, blah. Um, that seems to be working pretty well in actually detecting a real value and getting it returned as an integer. And then we have a lot of arguments that we could potentially pass to it. Uh, I do this now to actually supply RSAC, or the, the ciphertext, because that will be needed if you... Uh, are passing in the target or the real first argument as the file with actual information in there. So we try and determine whether or not we could actually have a ciphertext and do these things in the check or really the constructor function. And then a in the evaluate function or what it's actually going to try and do, it goes ahead and determines whether or not we have a given E. If we don't, we'll just kind of use the baseline one, as I suggested earlier. Um, we'll check if we have a wiener's little D attack, because I have support for that. Uh, I also have a support for a cube root attack that I'll showcase because of a little bit of Pico CTF 2018 and I determine n if it's not already given. Try and track, out, track down factors by calculating it or passing it to factor db. Determine phi i. <laughs> I don't know why I keep saying that. Uh, determine the totient. Go ahead and calculate d. And then what I do is actually go ahead and do what I just showed you, where I'm using that 0 plus uh, the hex value, because I don't want to forget about that. So because Katana is able to process this and locate the flag in whatever data is passed to it, it finds this relatively easily and like pretty well. So what I'll do to run this is Z shell is already auto completing it for me. Thanks. Go ahead and run Katana passing in the flag format we would expect for the CTF. So NCX in this case, and the dirty Chani test file that has those P and Q values that I need in there. Um, and then it will determine the actual C and ciphertext value from reading in that flag enc. So when I run this, it will go ahead and solve the challenge for me. So that was that. Super easy, super simple, and all we needed to do. The beauty of Katana uh, and Scimitar coming along too. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I know it's classic RSA and I've done it way too often, um, but I hope that last trick and technique is a worthy foot stomp or something that I really want to drive home and, and not have you forget about uh, when you play other competitions or when you see that error. Don't hesitate and just try and tinker. Add some zeros in there at the beginning or the end if you want to see if something might have been missing. So. If you did like this video, please do like, comment, and subscribe. I would love to see you guys in the Discord server. We have an awesome community. Link is in the description. I would be incredibly grateful to see you on Patreon, PayPal, and any support that you're willing to offer. I am just thankful, thankful, thankful. Can't say it enough. So. Thanks for watching, guys. See you in the next video.